So you want to learn about the Roman Civil War? Odds are that you have at least heard of it. Not to be confused with the Civil War which Sulla won decades prior, this one sent triples to all corners of the Republic. The Civil War saw the Caesarian faction, prominent figures being Gaius Julius Caesar, Marcus Antonius, Decimus Unius Brutus Albinus, cousin of Marcus Unius Brutus, and Gaius Trebonius to name a few, fight against the Pompeian faction, led by Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, his companions Titus Labinius, Metellus Scipio, Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus the Younger, Sextus Pompeius Magnus Bias, and Marcus Unius Brutus, cousin of Decimus Unius Brutus Albinus. This civil war saw families divided and forced into a brutal war. It also saw many similarly named people with long names, so a quick breakdown on how's it going to go. Marcus Antonius is Mark Antony. Decimus Unius Brutus Albinus is Brutus the White. The legate Gaius Trebonius is Trebonius. Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus is Pompey the Great. Titus Labienius is Labienius. Metellus Scipio is Scipio. Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus the Younger is Pompey the Younger, his son. Sextus Pompeius Magnus Pius is Pompey the Pius, his other son. And Marcus Unius Brutus slash Quintus Servilius Cepia Brutus will be referred to as Brutus. And those are just some of them, there are dozens more but they'll be covered as needed. Okay, now that that's covered let's get this thing on the road. Everything began because the Senate back in Rome was getting just a bit nervous about this Caesar guy's popularity and military command. During his campaigns in Gaul, Caesar was given consulship of the regions. He had command of Cisalpine Gaul, the land north of the Po River and south of the Alpine Mountains. Illyricum, referring to the Dalmatian coast of Croatia, and Transalpine Gaul, the lands north of the mountains and west of the Rhine. But why would Caesar and Pompey be at each other's throats? Didn't they have the triumvirate with Crassus to prevent these issues? They did. Keyword being did. You see around 55 BC, Marcus Licinius Crassus left to fight against Roman's longtime enemy, the Parthians of the Persian lands. With him was his son Publius Licinius Crassus, as well as Gaius Cassius Longinus, the brother-in-law of Brutus. Marcus and Publius Crassus perished during the campaign in 53 BCE. Good for this story as I don't have to spend time differentiating them, but bad for Caesar and Pompey as the triumvirate lost one third of its members. This was after Pompey's fourth wife Julius Caesar, Caesar's daughter has passed away a year before at the age of 22. As the Gallic Wars drew to a close, Caesar's popularity was reaching a level that nearly eclipsed Pompey's. If you know anything about Romans, it's that they have egos the size of the Roman prides frailer than a ceramic hammer. Is someone becoming more popular than the senators? That's not going to happen. Odds were that if Caesar ran for consul, he'd easily win. It was around this time, 55 to 52 BC, with it getting particularly bad between 53 to 52 BC, that anarchic political violence swept the city. Men such as Gaius Cassius Longinus and Titus and the Ismailo lead violent gangs through the city of Rome. It was during this political breakdown, in 55 BCE that Julius Caesar saw the slaves carrying her husband's bloody toga and when in distress induced premature labor. The child passed away and Julia followed, being in poor health from the birth. In 52 BCE Pompey was forced to take sole consulship of Rome to re-establish order to the city. He did so without convening the electoral senate. Kind of big issue if someone's claiming to have the republic democratic ideals at heart, while also supplanting the regular process when rapid action is needed. Funny how that goes. Getting back to Caesar, one senator by the name of Marcus Claudius Marcellus, wanted to curb Caesar's power. Saying that when Caesar defeated Vercingetorix and his forces, 
His task of quelling the rebellion in Gaul was completed and he had reached the end of his command. As well, his application for consulship in absentia, or not physically present, was voided as he could be in Rome. The Senate disagreed and extended his term to the 1st of March, 50 BCE. Well, 50 BCE rolled around and things went downhill fast. A year prior, Pompey had been critical to rejecting the proposal, now he was blocking every attempt made by Caesar for consulship. As long as Caesar had command of his provinces and his army, no consul for him. Despite the adamancy of his proposal, the Senate didn't share his sentiment. Senator Gaius Scribonius Curio the Younger held the position that it would only be fair for Caesar to yield command if Pompey did so in turn. Seems perfectly reasonable and fair, so obviously it failed. Despite being passed by a 370 to 20 vote on December 50 BC, it was rejected by Pompey and the consul of the time, Gaius Claudius Marcellus. They had a golden opportunity to prevent disaster but Pompey wouldn't yield. It's not like he couldn't tell his legions that he was temporarily stepping down from command and would call them up in the case of Caesar withdrawing from the agreement. But with Romigo rules supreme. Anyway, after Pompey and Marcellus vetoed the proposal, Claudius Marcellus spread the word that Caesar planned to seize Rome and put Pompey in charge of defending the city. So now, I want you to picture that you are Caesar. Having just finished a near decade long guerrilla war with the Gallic tribes, a war in which has seen your eldest die due to complications and are giving birth to your grandson, as well as your close friend Crassus dying after being outplayed by the Parthians and Guild. Finally, your quote, unquote ally Pompey demands that you are to relinquish your command and provinces. A blatant insult and doing so would mean another triumph stolen by the senator's machinations. If you were Caesar, would you be willing to take that insult after decades of service and another denial of a medal of valor for your service? Yet Caesar did not declare war over that. On the 1st of January, 49 BC, Caesar sent messengers to inform the senate that Caesar would be willing to give up his command at Transalpine Gaul. France and Switzerland areas, in exchange for retaining command of two legions and being allowed to retain his triumph and run for consul. Considering that civil war is on the horizon, it will be reasonable to think that any sane people would try to avoid it. All Caesar wanted was to retain two of his ten legions, keep the triumph he worked for, and the opportunity to try to be consul. Perhaps retaining command of 10,400 soldiers and 1,200 cavalry was too much, but the finer details could have been negotiated. Any reasonable people would agree. If they had an issue with the two legions encounter with a half legion or two legions worth of cavalry, anything to prevent a bloody war. The issue was that the Senate was not reasonable. Senator Marcus Porcius Gato Eutysensis of the former Carthaginian city Unica, or Cato the Younger rejected any discussion unless Caesar was physically present in the Roman Senate. To do so would strip Caesar of military command and thus, his triumph. On the 7th of January, 49 BC, Caesar was sent an ultimatum. Leave his post and come to Rome or be labeled as an enemy of Rome. Days later, Caesar's permission to stand for senator in absentia was revoked and his replacement for Transalpine Gaul was appointed. Despite numerous rejections by senators, even vetoes which would have voided the proposals, they were ignored and the Pompeian-leaning Senate declared Senatus Consul Tumultimum, the final decree of the Senate. This was similar to a state of emergency act under martial law, but it didn't strip Roman citizens of the right to a trial or change the magistrate's powers. The final act was meant to be enacted to preserve the Republic as it was done so during Sulla's command or during the Catiline Conspiracy. The final act gave the consuls dictatorial powers to ensure the safety of Rome. The act meant that any arbitration or discussion was concluded and the only means left were violent measures. With democracy put on hold. 
the Caesarian leaning senators fled the city to Caesar's camp across the Rubicon. The Rubicon was a small river that denoted where Cisalpine Gaul ended and Rome proper began. On the 10th or 11th of January 49 BCE, it is said that Caesar declared quote the die has been cast. Historians debate if it was as Suetonius claim was, alii actae, the die is cast in Latin, or as Plutarch said was a reference to the poet Menander, and if Philcabos, or he let the die be thrown. Despite this, Caesar's writings do not mention the Rubicon so hood exact thoughts at the time are a mystery. What was certain was the Gallic legions who served Rome. Of the Caesarian loyalists and the Pompeian loyalists, each force followed who they thought was deserving of their loyalty. Whether it was Rome or Caesar. For the men loyal to Caesar, he made it a point to show how the Senate had violated the rights of the tribunes by annulling their vetoes, listing the injustices done to him by his rivals, and the betrayal by Pompey. Finally, argue that the Senate's final act should only be enacted when the city was actually in danger. Of the Romans, many were still undecided on their allegiance in the civil war. Marcus Claudius chose neutrality as Pompey was meant to defend the city, not lead them to war. Brutus made an unusual choice. In his youth, Marcus Unius Brutus the Elder, his father, was put to death by Pompey. This is because he joined Marcus Lepidus in the insurrection to restore the power stripped by Sulla during the dictator's reign. This was exasperated by Consul Quintus Lutatius Catulus Capitolinus who blocked a constitutional reform. A rebellion was forced and it saw the two fail. Despite Brutus the Elder surrendering and being allowed to retire to a small town, Pompey sent Geminius to murder the man, Dick. Brutus's mother served Lil a half-sister to Cato of Unica, was one of Caesar's known lovers. By all accounts, he should have sided with Caesar, if not to avenge his father's murder then to side with a good possible father. Without the bodies to test the DNA, it can only be speculated, but there is a substantial chance that the 15-year-old Caesar had an affair with the 16-year-old Servla, even though she was married to Brutus the Elder for two to three years at the time. This is possible as Servula was known to be Caesar's favorite mistress. It was also likely that Brutus the White was another one of Caesar's bastards as it was said that he had a close relationship with them and viewed them as like a son to Caesar. But historians believe otherwise because they are dumb and the exact nature is subject to speculation. I like to think it's true because 1. Caesar would sleep with whoever he could and probably had a gaggle of bastards. And 2. It would add to the whole Greek tragedy vibe that this story has. Shockingly, Brutus sided with his mother's half-brother Cato the Younger, and joined the Pompeians. As did Titus Labinius, siding with Pompey over Caesar due to either an issue with Caesar claiming his glory or an existing loyalty to Pompey. Now Caesar had noticeably fewer men compared to the Pompeian loyalists but was able to quickly capture four cities, spreading the word that Caesar had done so back to Rome on the 17th of January, 49 BCE. According to Plutarch, upon hearing this, Pompey quote issued an edict in which he recognized a state of civil war, ordered all the senators to follow him, and, declared that he would regard as a partisan of Caesar anyone who remained behind. Wow! Really swaying those on the fence to side with you. Now, understandably many politicians who were pro-Caesarian or non-aligned at the time fled the city. This is because, as was the case for Sulla's civil war nearly three decades prior saw the mass executions of anyone not loyal to the person in command of the city at the time. Near the end of the month, Caesar and Pompey tried again to negotiate the issue. The terms proposed by Caesar were that they were to return to their provinces, Gaul for Caesar and Hispania for Pompey, and disband their forces. Pompey agreed on the terms that they seek arbitration in the Senate. Obviously, Caesar rejected this counteroffer as it would rid him of his upper hand while also putting him in the needed distance for the senators to attack him as well as revoke his right to triumph. 
Odds were that if he walked into the Senate, the Pompeian senators would have stabbed him on the spot. Hopefully, that never happens. Ha ha. So Caesar continued to advance and upon meeting Quinus Minucius Thermus at the city of Icudum, Quinus's five cohorts, totaling about 2,400 people deserted. With them deserted Caesar's forces were able to capture the region of Pisnum, Pompey's familial origin. Definitely a blow to his morale. The thing with Roman captured cities are that they tended to be looted, but Caesar denied it as they weren't conquering, but liberating. This boosted the Caesarian popularity at the expense of the Pompeians. The next month saw the relinquishment of Asculum and an increase of combatants to Caesar's forces. The first major resistance that Caesar faced is when he reached the city of Corfinium, garrisoned by one Lucius Domitius at Hennebarbus the man who the Pompeians placed in command of Gaul to replace Caesar. Caesar suggested that Ahenobarbus retreat to join Pompey's forces, but was rejected. Ahenobarbus declared that reinforcements were on the way and that he would hold until then. But that's not true. The thing was that Ahenobarbus sent word to Pompey saying that Corfinium was being attacked by Caesar and they needed help. Pompey's response was that no help was coming. After the week of the city being under siege, Ahenobarbus was arrested by his own men after he was caught trying to flee the city. Along with him, 50 senators and equestrians, were similar to knights and ranked below senators but above plebeians. They were all released by Caesar and the local magistrate, similar to the mayor of the area handing over 6 million sesterte, equal to 13.2 million USD to Caesar. Ahenobarbus intended to use it to pay his men, which Caesar did, giving Ahenobarbus his men their earned wage and in return only asking for an oath of their loyalty, which they gave. As his forces marched on the Adriatic coast, the eastern coast of Italy, he ordered his men to refrain from plundering and pillaging the cities. This act of clemency helped garner support from the masses and limit the chances that they would be turned on. While this was happening, Pompey realized that he didn't have the forces on the peninsula to fight Caesar and retreated to the city of Brindisi U, modern-day Brindisi. Planning to sail to the lands of Achaia, Epirus, and Macedonia, the lands currently known as Greece, and raise an army, completely abandoning his post as the defender of the city of Rome. To travel, he commandeered. Military talk for stole dozens of merchant ships to transport his men across the waters. Caesar and good forces arrived on the 7th of March but Pompey refused to negotiate. Caesar tried to block the ship's egress by erecting earthworks but Pompey fled with most of his men and all the ships in the harbor. Without any immediate threat to your safety, Caesar marched into Rome and called a synod meeting of all those who had stayed in the city. The meeting was called on the 1st of April and the turnout was poor. Despite this, he requested a delegation be sent by the Senate to negotiate with Pompey. It was agreed upon but there were no volunteers. After he called a concilium plebis, the People's Council, and promised 300 sesterce and a guarantee of the grain supply, but the reaction was muted. An often overlooked part of war is the expenses. Any war. No matter the size will be expensive to a degree. Much of the conflict so far had been financed personally by Caesar, so with the treasury now under his power, he had the coinage to continue without bankrupting himself. He told the Senate, or what was left, that he intended to use the coffers to fight Pompey. The issue was that he intended to use the Aerarium Sanctum or the special funds that existed to defend against Gallic attacks to deal with Pompey. This was justified as he had permanently dealt with the issue, in his own words. Senator L. Cassilius Metellus tried to veto act, but was ignored or threatened to withdraw. So now both sides' leaders were hypocrites as Pompey was tasked with defending Rome and had fled and Caesar claimed to defend the rights of the tribunes and had just threatened or disregarded their vote. Having taken the treasury, Caesar took control of 15,000 gold bars, 30,000 silver bars, 
and 30 million sister T coins. Which added up to, a lot of money. With the money issue dealt with, Caesar went to Hispania while leaving Mark Antony in charge of Italia. Before he could enter Hispano with his legions, the city of Massilia, modern Marseille Monaco, told him no. In command of the city was the brave Ahina Barbas. Despite having abandoned his position last time Caesar rolled up, he was put in charge of the city militia force. Now Caesar didn't want to stick around and deal with Ahina Barbas again so he and Legio 17, 18, and 19 put the city under siege. Gaius Trebonius was to oversee the troops and Decimus Brutus to deal with the naval forces due to his skills there. Heading off to Hispania, the siege began. A brief addition to the siege is that when the battering ram's head touched the gate, the siege had officially started. Caesar focused on Hispania as Pompey's generals Lucius Sophranius and Marcus Petrius held command of the peninsula. Drawing near Ilerda, modern Lida, Caesar's six legions, battle-worn, and under strength, after losing 700 men forced Afranius and Petrius to retreat southward to join up with Marcus Trandius Varro. They were encircled before they could join up and surrendered their five legions to Caesar. Pushing to the learned man Varroa position, in his bonnet ulterior. Varro surrendered and Quintus Cassius Longinus, brother or cousin of Cassius was placed in command of his bonnet with four legions of defectors or legions that surrendered to the Caesarian army. At least they were still employed. Having wrapped up Hispania, he marched back to Mastelia to see how things went. Meanwhile, Gaius Scribonius Curio the Younger, son of Gaius Scribonius Curio the Elder, lead and forced to take control of Sicily and the province of Africa, modern Tunisia. Curio the Younger was rumored to have had an affair with Mark Antony in his youth. He also had two kids Gaius Scribonius Curio Major and Gaius Scribonius Curio Minor. He was the last senator to try to reach a compromise between the two parties. Caesar gave Curio four legions and 1,000 Gallic cavalry to secure the grain supply as the province of Africa, Tunisia to Libya, and the Empire of Egypt supplied Rome with a large portion of their grains. Sicily was captured and Cato the Younger fled the island. Moving to Africa, Curio was up against the king of Numidia Juba I, and consul of Africa Publius Asus Verus. Their initial battle was Utica, the birthplace of Cato the Younger. The Caesarians defeated Verus and Juba I. The second battle of the Bagratis River did not turn out so well. Curio was beaten by the joint Numidia Roman forces. Choosing to die a soldier than live in disgrace, he fought to his last dying breath. Few of his men escaped on the ships, with the remaining seeking fair treatment under Varus. He agreed but Juba I did not. Juba had all but the most important prisoners of war executed on the spot. The remaining ones were taken back to Numidia to be executed or imprisoned. Pompey recognized him king of Numidia for his help. Returning to Rome in December of 49 BC, Caesar contacted Marcus Emilius Lepidus, the praetor and pontifex Maximus, to grant him the position of dictator. The official title was Magistrate Populi or Master of the People. This was for two reasons. Holding a position of power, leading an army, holding command of a province, praetorship, or similar grants a citizen imperium. With Imperium, Romans hold the power to act but with a modicum of impunity. Now with Magistrate Populi, Caesar conducted the consulship selection, in which he ran. He also recalled almost every senator exiled for disagreeing with Pompey in 52 BCE. Titus Aeneas Milo was excluded from this because fuck him in particular. Titus Milo was exiled for his bodyguards killing Pulcher in 52 BCE. Caesar also returned the rights of the children that had their political rights stripped during the proscription of Sulla. Which is good of him, convenient that he had his birthright stripped during Sulla's proscription but that's probably just a coincidence and not a slight against the dead dictator. 
Caesar was elected as consul alongside his god friend Publius Servilius Isauricus, who is best known for being the father of Gaius Octavius's first wife, Octavius being the great nephew of Caesar. Isauricus mostly left Caesar to act as he pleases. Now that Caesar didn't have to worry about his tribute or command being legally stripped, he relinquished his title of Magistrate Populi, 11 days after receiving the title. He continued his pursuit of Pompey into the land of the Grisai, Greece. Traveling to Brindisium, the land closest to Greece, Caesar debated how to best traverse the waters as Pompey had a fleet of sailors under the command of Bipulus defending the Adriatic Sea's mouth. Deciding to set sail, Caesar crossed on the Roman calendar's 8th of January, 48 BCE. I say that as it was likely late autumn due to the drift of the days. Roman days had four months that had 31 days, seven months with 29 days, and February being 28 days. 355 days? A lunar-based calendar. But the Romans had a brilliant strategy to add days in February to make sure that festivals fell on the appropriate days, this was decided by the Pontifex Maximus. Hopefully no one abused this to lengthen his term in office. Like Caesar for example. Getting back on track, Caesar's crossing in autumn caught the Pompeians with their trousers dropped as they had settled in for the winter, leaving the ships unmanned. Bipulus did manage to capture some of the ships returning to Brindisium, leaving the seven legions without a supply chain of food and stranded. Nevertheless, Caesar marched his forces into Apollonia with little resistance, allowing him to secure a foothold in a base of operations. The Pompeian supply lines were primarily focused around the area of Diarachium, modern Duras Albania. Caesar attempted to capture it but retreated when confronted by Pompey's larger forces. At least he's not stupid enough to attack an army larger than his without a strategy to win. So he waited roughly three months and on April 10th, Mark Antony arrived with the rest of the legions. Feeling confident in his odds, Caesar leaves his forces to capture Diarachium, and was repelled. What he didn't realize was that Pompey had the high ground. So he tried plan B, siege the area, and Pompey broke out. Right now, Caesar was 0 for 2 with Pompey on Diarachium, forcing a retreat at Thessaly. But it wasn't peaches and cream for the Pompeians as several of his overconfident allies accused him of prolonging the war to extend his command. They thought that he asked to strike now and in the fighting instead of prolonging the inevitable. With reinforcements from Scipio Syrian forces, Pompey sought a decisive battle with Caesar. Pompey was led from his strong position by Caesar and the two armies met at the plains of Pharsalus. The battle raged on and Labianius attempted to flank Caesar's reserve line and failed. This allowed Caesar's veterans to defeat Pompey's infantry and force a retreat and a loss as supporters. Many approached Caesar's camp searching for a pardon and were welcomed in. His goal wasn't to execute the Pompeians if they sought a pardon. He wished to retain his position and have his triumph. One of those who sought the pardon was one Marcus Brutus, who was welcomed by his definitely not father. Around October, after the battle, Caesar was declared Magistrate Populi again, this time serving the full year limit. Why? Not sure, but it might have been that his power as consul was ending and he wanted to continue his war without being forced to run for office during the crisis and give up his imperium. Now Pompey's war council was not looking good, several major figures had fled to Caesar's camp and they were hiding in Asia Minor. Their only hope was to see if the pharaoh of Egyptus, the boy King Ptolemy XIII would aid them. The thing about Egyptus is that the family tree of the Ptolemaic dynasty was closer to a braided rope than a tree. Half-siblings would marry their cousins or each other, then kill them after they had children to ensure that they were the sole rulers. If you want me to cover the messy family tree, let me know. Brief rundown, Ptolemy XII or the Flutus was deposed from his throne by his daughter Berenice IV Epiphania, 
This was a year after Ptolemy XII heavily bribed Caesar to prevent the annexation of Egypt and recognize him as a legitimate pharaoh. Technically Ptolemy XII was the bastard of Ptolemy IX Soter II and some unknown mother. Rome recognized him as the legitimate ruler, at a heavy cost to his country. He did this because his uncle Ptolemy had willed it that Rome would get Egypt if there was no Ptolemies left ruling Egypt. Ptolemy's brother wasn't part of the deal and Ptolemy, king of Cyprus's lands were annexed by Rome. This caused unrest and Berenice IV Epiphania was placed on the throne. Ptolemy now was a deposed king residing at Palmby's villa. Berenice IV then married Archelaus, son of Mithridates IV, and ruled Egypt. To Ptolemy, it looked like his kingdom was moving along without him. So Ptolemy XII had to pay the Pompeian supporter Alice Gabinius, 10,000 talents. Each talent of precious metal weighing 27 kilograms or 60 pounds. That's 27 tons or 29.76 US tons. Gabinius led his men and executed Berenice IV and Archelaus for usurping the throne. Ptolemy XII died in 51 BCE and in Rome executed as well. The Senate was busy with their own issues so Pompey was left in charge of it. The will stated that Cleopatra the seventh Theophilopater would rule with her brother Ptolemy XIII Philopater. I say that so you can get an image of what Pompey was doing when he fled to Egypt. Ptolemy XII had been a close ally of his and he had guaranteed that Ptolemy XIII ascended to the throne. Egypt had also just concluded a civil war as well which saw the 21-year-old co-pharaoh Cleopatra VII flee and her sister Arsinoe IV claim the seat of co-pharaoh. Initially, when Ptolemy XIII heard Pompey's plea, he accepted. Unfortunately for the Roman, Ptolemy's eunuch Pothinus, and rhetoric teacher Theodotus of Caius told him otherwise. The exact words are not known but it can be gleaned from the outcome that they said his death would placate Caesar. On the 29th of September, 48 BC, Ptolemy's guardian Achilles and Roman soldier Lucius Septimius executed Pompey in hopes of pleasing Caesar. Surprisingly, it failed. When Caesar entered Egypt, the boy king presented the severed head of Pompey. Disgusted by this act against a Roman citizen, Caesar ordered the body be located and Pompey be given a Roman funeral. They may have been enemies, but Ptolemy XIII did just order the murder of a Roman citizen. Scholars debate on if his reaction was because his son-in-law was executed or if it was because he had his just revenge stolen by a foreigner. But given how he pardoned many of those who sought it, I personally believe the latter. He may be petty, but he's not a prick. At least, that much of a prick. We do know that if it were not for the intervention of Cleopatra VII, it is likely that Egypt would have been destroyed. She managed to sway Caesar from dismantling the dynasty and instead return her to her throne, with her other brother, Ptolemy XIV serving as a figurehead to her actual authority. He agreed and had Pothinus executed for suggesting his plan to Ptolemy. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to Cleopatra. Now Cleopatra wasn't stupid, quite the opposite actually. Much of the modern perception of her is based on the writings of her adversaries, designed to portray her as vain and conniving. When you imagine Cleopatra, it is likely that it would be a lady in lavish clothes and expensive accessories decorating her scarcely covered physique. But this again is because of her enemies slandering her legacy. Without going too much into it, Cleopatra VII spoke many languages and provided reforms, general services, and social overhauls. On her linguistic skills, Plutarch wrote, quote, Pleasure also came with the tone of her voice, and her tongue was like a many stringed instrument. She could turn in easily to whichever language she wished and she conversed with few barbarians entirely through an interpreter, and she gave her decisions herself to most of them, including Ethiopians, Troglodytes, Hebrews, Arabians, Syrians, Medes, and Parthians, quite skilled, so it was of little surprise that she caught the attention of Caesar. 
Remember that Caesar had a thing of comparing himself with Alexander the May and Cleopatra was the descendant of Alexander the Great's possible half-brother Ptolemy Soter. But he was a foreign general in Egypt and this was used to rouse unease in the city. So he read from Ptolemy 12's will and bequeathed Ptolemy 14 and Arsinoe for dominion of Rhodes. With things calming down, Caesar attended the banquet hosted by the current rulers Ptolemy 13 and his unexiled sister Cleopatra VII. As this happened, Caesar was made aware of a plot against him by Aeschylus and Pothinus. He had his army encircle the feast and try to detain them. Aeschylus escaped but Pothinus did not and was executed. Aeschylus rallied Pompey's army and damned them as Caesar's completely glossing over the fact that they had their leader murdered. The palace was put to siege and, severely outnumbered, set up to defend with the pharaoh Ptolemy as his hostage. As this happened, Arsinoe escaped with her tutor Ganymede to join Aeschylus. She proclaimed herself as the queen of Egypt and had Aeschylus executed for disagreeing with her new plan. The water to the palace was poisoned by Ganymede and Caesar released Ptolemy in an attempt to weaken Arsino's forces. But that failed as they decided that Cleopatra and Caesar were the biggest issues. It was also around this time that Caesar found out that sex has consequences as Cleopatra was pre-Gagon and with his son, nicknamed Caesarian or Little Caesar, Pizza Pizza. The siege was not to last as the Prince of Pergamon. Pergamum Turkey, arrived accompanied by Caesar's reinforcements. They secured the lighthouse of Alexandria and the pathway connecting it to the palace. With the combined forces, Ptolemy XIII was forced into retreat and drowned in the Nile River after his ship capsized. Ironic, given that he had died in the lifeblood of his kingdom. Caesar collected the body of the young pharaoh and wanted to present the deceased to Cleopatra. It was likely that she greeted the Roman general dressed in clothes bearing the symbol of Isis, otherwise known as Aeside, translating to mean the queen of the throne. An obvious symbolic connection there. The siege was not without its losses as, during the fighting, the legendary library of Alexandria caught fire, resulting in the loss of many of the works. To celebrate their victory, Cyprus was gifted to the queen and her new co-pharaoh Ptolemy XIV Philobator. Despite the fact that they were, officially, co-rulers, the twelve-year-old pharaoh Ptolemy XIV held little command. Given how quickly Caesar moved on the quail issues previously, it was shocking that he remained in Egypt for several months. Officially it was to secure Cleopatra's rule but realistically it was so he could relax and ride along the Nile with his pregnant lover. So obviously Farnaces II of Pontus would use this time to reclaim the independence of his land. The kingdom of Pontus at its height covered the lands from most of Turkey, southern Ukraine with all of Crimea, the western Caucasus coast, and small pockets of cities on the coast of modern Bulgaria and Romania. The land was conquered by Pompey in 63 BCE. Pharnaces II was able to seize the lands of Pontus, the northeastern lands of Turkey, bordering the Black Sea, because Pompey had stripped the troops primarily located there to fight Caesar. Without them, Pharnaces II was able to reclaim much of his dynasty's historic land. Gnaeus Domitius Calvinus, the governor of Roman Asia, modern western Turkey, tried to repel the king of the Crimean Bosporan kingdom's attack Nicopolis in December 48 BC, resulting in Pharnaces' victory over Calvinus's inexperienced men. Caesar left Egypt shortly afterward, leaving three legions under the command of a freedman to maintain Cleopatra's rule. Shortly after, she bore her eldest son, Ptolemy Caesar, or as he would have been called in his native Koine Greek, Ptolemy's Philobator, Philometer, Caesar, Caesarian, Myconic Greek isn't Greek but it roughly meant Ptolemy father loving, mother loving, Caesar, little Caesar. If Caesar had an issue with Ptolemy 15 bearing his name, he never said anything about it, meaning that Caesarian was the son as he didn't deny that claim. 
back to Farnesus too. Romans portrayed him as a cruel man who castrated captured legionaries. Upon the meeting of the two, Farnesus attempted to parley but was continually stonewalled by Caesar. He gave simple terms, withdraw from the lands, return what was stolen and release the prisoners. This would defeat the whole purpose of the campaign so Farnesus said no. Meeting at the hill outside of Zayla, modern Zayl, Turkey, the battle began. After a brief confusion amongst the Romans, Caesar's men forced Farnesus' men off their hill and the Caesarian forces broke through their right flanks, causing the rout of their forces. Farnesus managed to retreat to his kingdom and was promptly assassinated. Apparently they were fine with his war when he was winning, but losing, unacceptable. This fight was a noticeably short affair. In one of the writings on the war, he is noted as having said the famous, Vini, Vd, Vc, which meant I came, I saw, I conquered. This served two purposes as it proved the might of Caesar for being able to defeat the king so quickly and mock Pompey for earning his fame defeating such an easy adversary. Meanwhile, back in Rome, stuff was still happening. One Publius Cornelius de Labula, was the tribune of the plebs for the year 47 BC and tried to have a bill passed. The bill aimed to abolish debt, partly due to the non insubstantial amount that he owed. Acting leader Mark Antony was advised against it, the Senate though voted to support it. Things turned violent and Caesar would have to clean up when he returned to Rome. Antony may have been more willing to use violence as he believed that De Labula was sleeping with his wife. Then Caesar's 9th and 10th legions, primarily composed of veterans, mutinied so Mark Antony had to try to resolve it. Followed by political violence in the streets, forcing the Senate to pass a final act. But there was no one in Rome who had any authority to enforce it. When Antony did return, there was already a substantial loss of life, tanking Anthony's reputation. To top it all off, Metellus Scipio along with Labianus went to Hispania ulterior to convince one of the governors Caesar appointed to defect. Back to Caesar, when he returned to Rome in late 47 BC, he was greeted by Cicero who asked for a pardon and was granted. Cicero ran the odds and without Pompey, his faction couldn't win. Which is pretty fair, Pompey was the figurehead of his faction, and without him, there would have been a power vacuum that his generals would try to fill. But while in Rome, Caesar ran and won his fifth consulship with Lepidus as his co-consul. In Campania, a mutiny arose and Caesar sent future historian Gaius Salustius Crispus, to try and resolve it. It failed when the mob tried to murder him, so once again. Caesar had to try to resolve the issue. Definitely not plagiarizing Alexander the mostly decent speech when his men mutinied, he spoke to the men nearing Rome. He told the veterans that they would be immediately relieved of duty and would be granted their land and retirement bonus. He also made a point to refer to him as queer rights, roughly meaning citizen, instead of legionari, legionaries. Most were shocked by the blasé nature of their dismissal, many pleaded to continue serving him. After falsely considering it, he agreed with the ringleaders being placed in dangerous or otherwise risky positions during his next campaign. Returning to Rome, Caesar was left with the matter of the Pompeian estate. Time for economic policies, yeah. Or more specifically, the estate and property of the deceased are those still unpardoned. And on the matter of Don Abella's debt cancellation bill, he declined it, saying that with the amount he owed, the bill would make him the chief beneficiary. Then with the estates, he was supposed to have sold at rates that his allies were disappointed in. Hinting at the need for a quick injection of money. He didn't stay long as he was needed in Africa. Before he left. Cicero told him that he had lost confidence in Antony's command, but not Donabella's. This may seem unnecessarily rude to Antony, but it was not without its merits. Antony lacked the linguistic sense and political understanding that Caesar had. If I was to define Caesar in one word, 
It would be crafty. Antony would be, himbo. Good man, but a few sticks short of a bundle. But back to Caesar. Gathering his men in Lilybem, modern Marsala, Sicily. Amongst his staff, he appointed a man from the family of Scipio. This is because of a myth that no Skip EO could be defeated in Africa. And the Romans are nothing if not superstitious. He departed on the 25th of December, 47 BCE with multiple ships carrying his six legions. Things went pear-shaped when a storm got them when sailing, leaving him with three and one-half legions, in addition to 150 cavalry to land at the ancient city of Hadriandum, modern-day Hamam. Tunisia. It is said but not known if true, that Caesar fell on the sands upon landing, but played it off having said that he now had a hold of Africa. I feel it is important to add that Africa was the name of the province of Rome along the southern coast of the Mediterranean, the land south and slightly west of Italy. Having a Scipio was important as Caesar was up against Metellus Scipio and King Juba won with fewer men than they had fielded. His men were fighting against King Juba of Namibia's 120 war elephants. Have you ever seen an elephant? They are massive and can crush a man easily. Comparatively, most people in that era never saw animals unless they were locally available. Now try to imagine how the average soldier felt trying to fight that massive beast. Setting up base at Raspina, modern monster Tunisia, after Hadriumtum refused to surrender. Sending someone to Sicily to send reinforcements, he tried to make do with his inexperienced legionaries. Given that they were inexperienced, he had foraging parties were repelled by the combined Numidian, Pompeian forces. Lady Fortuna shone on Caesar as Bacchus II of East Mauritania, modern Morocco and Algiers, and Roman mercenary Publius Sicius, declared war on the Namibian king. The Berber king was not acting on Caesar's orders and was seizing the opportunity to weaken his neighbor. As well, Caesar received 800 Gallic cavalry and two legions with a large supply of food. Putting Musa to siege, veteran legionnaires defected to Caesar and reinforcements from the mutineers of Campania. The siege of Usida was unlikely to fall any time soon so Caesar raided the food stores and left to conquer Thapsus. Thapsus went south pretty quick for the Pompeians despite having more men. Plutarch says that Caesar felt an epileptic episode and needed to rest, so his men attacked the Pompeian lines and inflicted heavy casualties. 10,000 Pompeians to 50 Caesarian was a good rate. The Pompeian War Council was able to mostly escape, with Scipio choosing to take his life after his ship was intercepted by Caesar's forces. King Juba made a suicide pact with legionary Marcus Petrius to die by single combat as it was preferable to capture by Rome. Among the Pompeian council, Labienius had fled to Hispania to join Pius Pompey. Shortly before Thapsus fell, the city of Utica was defeated in April 46 BCE. Cato the Younger wasn't present for the battle but held the city. He supposedly communicated with his outnumbered men and at dinner. He then drew a sword and opened your stomach up. A doctor ran in and saw him disemboweling himself. Cato died before he could be stopped. With the main opposition in Africa dealt with, Caesar traveled to the Pompeian supporter cities and issued punitive fines. You think that will keep him busy, but not too busy to have an affair with a queen? He, met with Anomora of West Mauritania for a while. Historian Suetonius held her in the same regard as Cleopatra, showing that she was of a fairly distinguished lineage. Caesar left in June and returned to Rome in July. With the Pompeian forces in tatters, Caesar petitioned the Senate to hold his triumphs. Now to triumph, or two triumphs, or even five, but for consecutive triumphs. One for his exploits in Gaul, another for the defeat of Ptolemy XIII, one for the victory against Pharnaces II, and a last one for defeating Juba I of Namibia, making sure to portray it as a victory against Juba, a Namibian, 
and not Scipio, a Roman. The festival lasted from the 21st of September to the 2nd of October. I'll cover triumphs in more detail some later time but a triumph is a military celebration entirely funded by the triumphant general. It was to inform Roman citizens of what happened during the campaigns, a show of the spoils of war, and definitely not sacrifice the captured nobles to Jupiter. They just ritually executed them at the foot of the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, every time. As he traveled in his triumph card in a pure purple robe and gold laurel leaf crown, he was preceded by 72 lictors. Lictors being civil servants who are attending to the consul or dictator and carry a bundle of sticks around an axe known as a fasces. This is unusual as consuls are allowed to have 12 lictors and dictators having 24. Caesar had three times as he was dictator three times. Most people might have an issue with it but the legionaries didn't. Caesar donated to each one at least 16 years wage, with more for the centurions and officers. After the celebrations and a song sung about the bald fucker returning to Rome so the citizens should hire their wives. After the festivities were done, Caesar took a legion of veterans and headed to go to Hispania. He'd have taken more, but most of the other veterans had retired. Upon arrival, Caesar took over from the generals he had stationed to siege the area. The fighting was noticeably crueler as the Pompeian supporters were treated as rebels and in turn, suspected Caesarian supporters and their families were massacred. This happened at Tigua near Cordoba, causing a massive mutiny in the Pompeian army and forcing Pompey the Younger to retreat. They were pursued in Munda and Hispania ulterior and forced to fight. Assisting Pompey the Younger was Titus Labinius. The fighting took place in March of 47 BCE and it was thanks to the Legia 10 piercing the right flank that caused the rout of the Pompeians. Labinius attempted to stop the rout but was unsuccessful and perished during the fight. Pompey the Younger escaped but was beheaded not long after. Sextus Pompeius Magnus Pius managed to escape to flee to Syria and stage a small revolt. But with Pompey the Younger and Labianius dead, the civil war is over. Now that the war was over, the next battle was the political field. He declared a 50 day of giving thanks and had Liberator added to his name as well as a temple dedicated to liberty. The next few months saw further titles added to his official title as the Senate wanted to retain his favor due to his popularity amongst the citizens. An ivory statue of Caesar was added next to the kings and at the temple of Quirinus. Quirinus held the high status as according to Plutarch in Life of Romulus, the founder of Rome once disappeared and reappeared to one Perculus Julius to tell him that the gods took him and that he was now the god Quirinus. If Romulus and Quirinus were always one being or as they were separated and then rejoined is debated by scholars, but regardless of the fact, Caesar having your statue placed inside the god's temple was obvious. The month of Quinctus was renamed Julius and a temple to Caesar's mercy was built. Lastly, Imperator and Parents Patria was appended to his name. So if you're keeping track, Liberator Imperator Gaius Julius Caesar Parents Patriae with Divus added on with the cult of Caesar following his death. A special knot throne was also added to the Senate for him. Next, he had established colonies for his veterans to settle and granted Latin rights to many loyal Gallic towns. This gave them all the general benefits of Roman citizens as well as the right to apply for full citizenship. So happy veterans and many thousands of new possible citizens added to Rome who had Caesar to thank. Yet Caesar made a blunder in October of 45 BCE when he got the right to triumph for ending the civil war. This was less popular as it was not a war against enemies of Rome, but citizens. He also granted the rights to his legates, Quintus Pedius, his nephew or a grandnephew, and the unrelated Quintus Fabius Maximus. Lastly, he had allies appointed to the seat of consul hours after the previous one died. He also planned more military excursions against the Parthians of Persia and the Dacians of southeast modern Romania, 
some point in the next few years. But that's all for now, I'll cover his political career until his death next, but... I've been the Irish Explainer, and this has been a brief history on Caesar from 51 to 45 BCE and it was heavy on the facts, I'll try to keep the next one more streamlined. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to place them in the comments below. Let me know what I should cover next. Have a great day and make sure to like, comment and subscribe.